we're going to look at an attribute of God that, quite frankly, it's one of the most widely believed and yet most often doubted about who God is. The fact that God is loving, and more specifically, that he's a loving father. And those two words right there, loving father, can create some challenges inside a lot of, a lot of us. Because the truth is, is we all have dads, and you might have a good dad, you might have not such a good dad, or you had an absent dad. And as a pastor, one of the things that I see most common, anytime people are walking through problems in their lives, one of the most common things I see is that there is an unhealthy connection to an earthly father. Now, if you don't believe me, if you're like, uh, I don't know about that, Pastor Sam, like my dad was pretty good. That, it's true. There are good dads, okay? But the truth of the matter is, is that just back in 1995 and all the way up to now, every year, there's been over 15 million children on average who live in a single mother home. So that's a lot of people. That's a lot of us. That's a lot of us who have daddy issues. And we do, we've got daddy issues and we're gonna talk about that today. So here's what I want you to realize that whether you had a good dad or not a good dad, you still got an issue because our earthly relationships can impact the way we see our heavenly father. Here's where we are. Our scripture today, our main scripture is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, see what great love the father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. I need you to do me a favor. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, I am a child of God. Okay, now this time turn to the other person and tell them even louder like you believe it. Say, I am a child of God. Those of you joining us online, put it in the chat right now. I am a child of God. Here's the thing. This verse is so interesting to me because it does create some issues because there's two different types of people that read this verse in two different types of way. You've got the shouters and the doubters, okay? You got the shouters. These are the people that are like, yeah, I am a child of God. God loves me, right? And then you got the doubters that are like, if God is a loving father, why would he love someone like me? And if we're honest, if we keep it true, even the shouters at times become doubters. Even those of us who have incredible amount of faith, there are moments where we stop and doubt, can God really love me? Does God really love me? And as we talk about this loving father, perhaps you had a great dad, perhaps you had an absent dad, perhaps you had no dad at all or someone who was bad. Maybe you had a great dad who showed up at every game, took you fishing, taught you great things about life. But maybe just thinking about your dad brings up some pain and some hurt. Regardless of how you grew up, we need to acknowledge that our experience with our earthly fathers and our earthly relationships can shape the view of our heavenly father. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about these daddy issues that happen in our lives. So today, I wanna to talk to anyone who has ever questioned God's love. If you've ever wondered or doubted if God loved you, if you've desperately searched for approval, affirmation, or acceptance, or perhaps you just need to know someone actually loves you, this message is for you. And my title today is, When You Feel Like God Can't Love You. When you feel like God can't love you. When I think of dads, I can't help but think of my dad. My dad is actually a really great dad. Now, he is not perfect by any means, made mistakes in his life, but he's a great dad. And let me give you some context. We grew up pretty poor, but my dad never let us embrace a mindset of poverty. He never let us get down on ourselves. In fact, he taught us a lot of values of like taking care of things. So if you didn't own much, but you owned something, he would tell us like, take care of it. Keep it shiny, like keep it clean, like be organized and keep your stuff nice. And he taught us these things. And you know, we came from Mexico. And so my dad, his English, he has a heavy accent, but he learned all the fra phrases and cliches to inspire and to encourage us. So he would tell me, he's like, go get him, tiger. Like that was one of his favorite. That's one of his favorite ones. He told me before I preached, go get him, tiger. He's like, you're my champ. You're a champion. Go after it. And then he told us he had this accent. And one time he said, remember, kids, you're the cream of the crap. And we're like, <laughs> and we're like wait, what? The, the cream of the what? And he's like, yeah, you rise to the top. 
And like, oh, the cream of the crop. Yeah, the cream of the crop, we rise to the top, right? But he did, he encouraged us a ton. And uh, he was always encouraging me and reminding me that there was a champion, a warrior inside of me. And I love my dad for that. I love that he encouraged me that way. Uh, in fact, he signed me up uh, for Little League, for baseball. And I was like, dad, like, I can't play baseball. Like, I'm really small. I can't play baseball. And he looked at me and he said, hey, you're not a Mexican. You're a Mexican. You can do it. And I was like, all right. I feel like I can do it. So I played baseball for a little bit. And then my freshman year in high school, I was like, you know what? I'm going to try out for the basketball team. I thought I could be the Mexican Michael Jordan. That's what I thought. I'll start my career now. So I went to try out and um, I was trying out. And then about five minutes in, the coach calls me over. He's like, Marion, come here. So I'm like, yeah, what's up coach? Ready? Yeah. And he's like, I got to cut you. And I was like, what? what? And he's like, I got to cut you, man. You're too short. I was like, oh. And then before I could get a word out, he goes, and you're too slow. If you were faster, I might have a space for you, but you're too short and you're too slow. That was the end. I mean, I never tried out for another team ever again. Now, thankfully, it all worked out great because I'm so thankful that there's no height requirement for pastors. Come on. It's so good, right? It's so good. Look, I'm telling you right now, and there's some of you that you just need to hear this right now. Maybe this, what I'm about to tell you is everything that God brought you here. Because there are those of you here today, those of you joining us online, that somebody said something to you. Somebody declared something over your life. Somebody said you were worthless. Somebody said you'll never accomplish anything. Somebody declared negative things and labels over your life. And maybe today God brought me to just remind you that if he can take a kid out of the hood in Los Angeles and put him on a stage at Life Church preaching God's word, if he can do that with me, he can do that with you. He's got more for you. He's called you. He's equipped you. He's got his his spirit lives inside of you. And maybe that's all you needed to hear today, but that's not my message. So y'all settle down. <laughs> y'all make a guy lose it up here, man. I want us to take a look at a scripture when Jesus interacts with a father. We're in Luke chapter eight, verse 40, and we're going to read the entire section of scripture because there's so much good in it. I want you to catch this, okay? Luke chapter eight, verse 40 says this. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. At this point, the gig is up. She's caught. They found out she touched him. Verse 47 says, when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. And verse 48 is so important. Check this out. It says, daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So let's break this down, okay? Okay. You've got this earthly father whose daughter is dying. And he does what any good dad would do. He does anything that he needs to do to get her healed, to make her well. Think about this. So he was a religious leader in the synagogue. And what we know about these religious leaders back in the day, most of them, if not all of them, didn't really like Jesus. And yet he was willing to risk his reputation, possibly even his job, because of his daughter. He's a good dad goes after Jesus, and Jesus, what does he do? He agrees to go with him. He says, yeah, I'll walk with you. I'll go with you to your house. Jesus goes with him, and he starts to walk, but then what does Jesus do? Jesus stops. 
He stops. I mean, that's kind of like taking your pregnant wife who's in labor and stopping to get some burgers and a shake and fries. Like, that just doesn't make sense, right? Like, you got to get there, and you could imagine being that dad. There's one thing I know for sure about this dad. He was not Latino. He was not. Because I promise you, if he was a Latino dad, he wouldn't be like, Jesus, papi, we got to go, papi, let's go. My daughter's sick. We got to go. Leave her alone. Let's go right now, papi. He would have done everything, right? That's the truth. He tried everything. One must believe that Jairus at least was a little disappointed with Jesus, if not completely disillusioned with him. Why are you stopping? What could, one could make even the conclusion that in that moment, his perception of Jesus, his view of who Jesus was changed. And this can happen to us. Maybe it's your dad who called you something when you were crying and that hurt you. Or maybe it was an absent father who worked all the time and didn't have time for you. Maybe you never got to know your father. Or perhaps it was a coach or a teacher or a friend or a parental figure. And they said something to you and hurt you. And that, came, that caused a wound inside of you. And you became disappointed or disillusioned with that person. And here's what happens. You see, our earthly relationships impact the way we view our heavenly father. And I want to give you three lies that typically we believe about God. These are common misconceptions that we have about God. The first one is this. The truth is, uh, the lie is this, is that God is judgmental. He's judgmental. He judges me by my mistakes. He judges me by the things that I've done wrong. But the truth is this, is that God is actually compassionate. Psalms 103 says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. That's the first lie. The second lie is this, is that God is angry. He's just waiting for me to mess up. He's just waiting for me to fail and he's going to lose his temper and strike me down. That's the lie. But the truth of the matter is that God is patient. Our heavenly father is patient. Exodus 34 says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That's the truth. The third lie that we see is that God is hateful. There's no way God could love someone like me. I've messed up too much. I've committed too many sins. I keep doing the same thing over and over. How could God love someone like me, but that's a lie. The truth of the matter is this, is that God is full of love. Romans 5, 8 says it this way, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. See, God is loving. He's a loving father. And my hope for you today is that through scripture, you would see and know God as the loving father that he is. So let's go back to our story. Let's look at the two daughters, okay? First, you've got the 12-year-old daughter who is sick. She's dying. She's got no control over the situation. She can't get up. She can't go to Jesus. But she has a dad who could. Then you've got a woman who's been suffering for 12 years. Let me give you the details of this. So for 12 years, this woman is hemorrhaging. And she's spent all her money to find a cure, cannot find a cure. Because of her disease, she was considered ceremonially unclean, which basically meant she could not touch anyone or anything without making them unclean. So think about this, 12 years, 12 years of going without the basic need of human touch, 12 years without being able to love somebody, embrace somebody, 12 years without hugging somebody, without receiving a kiss, 12 years of being completely abandoned, completely ostracized from society. She could not touch anyone, let alone anything. Anything she sat on would become unclean. 12 years. And she's got nobody to go on her behalf. And yet you see, both need healing. Otherwise, they'll die. The truth is, is that no matter how you grew up, we all have wounds that require healing. And that healing only comes when we experience the love of the Father, when we receive our heavenly Father's love. So how? 
How do we experience the love of the Father? There's three ways. First, he walks with us. He walks with us. This is what God does. Jesus walked with Jairus heading to his house to see his daughter. See, whatever your situation is, whether you're in the mountaintop or whether you're in the valley, he walks with you. Jesus says, yes, I will walk with you. Scripture says this in Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and he will be what? Say it with me. He will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. The truth is, is that so many people are walking alone, walking by yourself and walking through life on your own. Honestly, it just sucks. Like when you think about walking through life and all the challenges that you face, maybe you get some bad news and you've got nobody to share that with, to walk with you on that. Maybe you find out that a family member is sick with a terminal disease and you're walking by yourself and There's no one to inspire you, to believe with you for healing for that family member. Maybe you're walking through life and somebody betrays you. And you're by yourself, you're alone with that pain. Or maybe it's something really good. Maybe you get a promotion and you've got nobody to celebrate with. Nobody to jump around with. Nobody to to just cheer. Walking alone just sucks. But when Jesus walks with you, Oh, that changes everything. See, there's something special about walking with someone who loves you. And if you're gonna walk with someone, walk with someone who actually loves you. Let me just stop real quick for a moment because I gotta talk to some single people here today. Those of you joining us online, if you're single, maybe put it in the chat. I'm single, ready to, no, don't put that in the chat. Don't put that in the chat, that's dangerous. But look, I gotta talk to you because there's some of you single people that you're walking through life with somebody who just tolerates you. Or you're walking with somebody who worships the ground you walk on, but the moment you mess up, they're out. Don't walk with people who just tolerate you or just put up with you. Walk with someone who actually loves you. It makes all the difference. In fact, I want to to show it to you this way. My wife, Liz, is here with me today, and I'm going to ask her to come up here on stage with me. Can y'all please encourage my wife to come up? Rex, would you help your mom come up? Come on up. Thanks, buddy. Hi, babe. (laughs) So this is my bride, uh, and uh, this May, we celebrate 20 years of marriage. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, we got married on the beach, and so I think for our 20, like, it's probably a good idea to go to back to the beach. Are we on prices right here? No, is there a <laughs> tropical prize? No, here? no, no, no <laughs> curtains, no curtains. But um, I figured, why wait till May to go to the beach? Like, I asked the guys in the back to actually give me a hand, and so... Guys, could you take us to Turks and Caicos? Oh. Come on, baby. Yeah, Turks and so Caicos. Nice. So would you, go, would you go on a walk with me on the yes, beach? Yes, I'll always walk with you. Yes. Did I take my shoes off? No, no need to take your shoes off. Okay. You, you, won't get, you won't get sand in your toes. But <laughs> we might get sand in other places. Uh, hey. uh, no, no, no. Back to Jesus. Bring it back to Jesus. Back to Jesus. So when we walk through life and I get some bad news, yeah, I'm, I'm there. I'm there. My shoulder's there. I'm there to support you, encourage you, remind you where our strength comes from. Yep. If we get news that a family member's sick, somebody's dying. Yeah, I, I mean, even in the sad times, I'm going to be there, be sad with you, and, you know, continue in prayer with you, join you. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody betrays me, a friend betrays me. I shank them. No, no. <laughs> no, no, I don't. Back to Jesus. You could take a girl out of the hood, but you can't take the hood out the girl, man. No, we don't shake them. We don't shake them. Um, but if it's a good thing, it's like if I get a promotion, you know. Like, we're going to hit the Latin music. Yes. We're going to dance, baby. Yes. We dance a little bit. Get, yeah. get, I mean, we can party, baby. Come on, baby. Let's go. We party There's right a here. time and a place for everything. This is not the time or the place. <laughs> Back to Jesus. Back to Jesus. Back to Jesus. No twerking for Jesus. All right. Um, but see, life is better. Like when you walk with someone who loves you, like you go through life. And this is what God does. Jesus walks with us and he shows us his love. He walks with us. And 
Babe, I just got to tell you, I'm so thankful for you. You've uh, walked with me for um, you know, more than 20 years, and uh, you are. You do everything you just said. It's not just words, but you actually live it out, and you're a great example of how God walks with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you still owe me a trip to the beach, though. Oh, yes. But this was, this was kind of cheap. I mean. I still beach. But we didn't even go through TSA. Like, it's good. <laughs> Help you, Mom. Yes. I know what you're thinking, like, Sam, man, when you saw that picture of me with, as a little kid with those ears, you're like, how did you land Liz? Uh, it's all God's favor, man, all his grace. So he walks with us, but then he also stops for us. That's what Jesus does. Jesus stopped for the woman with the issue of blood. He stopped for her. And Jesus, God, has been stopping for you from the beginning of time. What did he do in Genesis? We hear that God worked for six days and on the seventh day, what did he do? He stopped to rest, to show us how to rest and to be refreshed in him. That's what it is. He stops for us from creation all the way to now. He stops for us. So here's the thing. If you feel like you're unlovable, he stops for you. If you feel not worthy, he stops for you. If you feel like you failed beyond forgiveness, he stops for you. If you feel unseen, you feel unknown, you feel overlooked, you feel like nobody listens to you, he stops for you. And if you reach out to Jesus, guess what? He'll stop for you. He'll stop whatever he's doing to walk with you. He's not going to just leave you behind. And listen to me today. He's stopping for you. He's stopping for you right here, right now. Now, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter how hard life has been, he's stopping for you in this moment. He walks with us. He stops for us. And finally, he talks to us. He talks to us. I love this in scripture. Hundreds of times, it's referenced in the Bible that God speaks to man. And in our story he talks to the woman. And I want you to see this progression that happens. Check this out. She goes from being ceremonially unclean, ostracized from community. And then she becomes part of the crowd. She's just one in the crowd. But then she reaches out to Jesus, is healed in an instant, and he looks at her and he calls her daughter. This is the only place in scripture where Jesus calls someone daughter. She goes from being in the crowd to being a daughter of the living God. You see, the lavish love of your father labels you as his child. And you might say, but Sam, I thought, Labels weren't good. No, you need to understand. There are those of you that you've been, you've had someone place a label on your life. But when you receive the love of the Father, His lavish love over you, it takes those labels away and He marks you as His child. You are a child of God. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. His lavish love does that to us. It labels you, it marks you as his child. He walks with us, he stops for us, and he talks to us. But Sam, what, what happened to the little girl who was dying? I'm so glad that you asked. I'm so glad you were wondering about that because I want to I wanna wrap this up for you. You see, many times we think that when Jesus is working on someone else's issues, he's left us behind. But I promise you, his love is way bigger than that. His love is big enough to cover all of it. So what happens with this 12-year-old daughter who's dying? Some men came and told the dad, hey, it's too late. She's died. She's passed away. Stop bothering Jesus. It's too late. But you see, when all hope is gone, 
when it seems like the end has arrived, when it seems like there's no way out, that's when Jesus steps in. He says, no, I've got the last say. And so what does he do? He walks with Jairus, gets to the house, stops there and talks to the little girl, grabs her hand. And Luke 8, 54 says this, but he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. See, your situation may appear dead. It may appear hopeless. Maybe it's a relationship that you've been fighting through. Maybe it's an addiction that you've been battling with. Maybe it's in your finances. You may even feel like Jesus has stopped working on your situation and focused on someone else. But let me just tell you, your heavenly father can handle it all. His love is big enough and he's not stopping working on you. He's not quit, he didn't quit. He's not done. His love is big enough. His love is big enough for the, the woman and his love was big enough for the little girl. I want to tell you one more story of another woman and another child. Um, this is Maria. Maria, at 19 years old, um, was sexually assaulted. Tragic, tragic time. As a result of that, she became pregnant and she faced a lot of judgment. She was told, think about your future. You're young, you've got your whole life ahead of you. And she had to make decisions, but she decided, no, I, I'm gonna keep this child. It was around that time that she, she actually reached out to Jesus. She went to a church who loved her and embraced her and didn't judge her. They just, they just loved on her and said, you're welcome here. And she went on and had this child and she took the child to church as a baby and dedicated this child to Jesus and said, I don't have a dad for her. You're gonna need to be her father. I need you, Jesus, to be her father, to provide, to protect, for, protect her, to love her. And she raised this little child as best as she could. No father, no father figure. At times, Men came into their lives only to become abusive to mom. It's a pretty bad situation. At one point, they found themselves sleeping in their car, no place to go. And the place that they lived, the streets that they lived on, was not a good part of town. In fact, this little girl, as she continued to grow, she would walk through the streets, and there'd be prostitutes getting kicked out of their car by their pimps. There'd be drug deals going down right around here, gang, gang violence as she walked to school. And yet, this little girl continued to grow, trusting in her heavenly father, receiving the love of her heavenly father. At an earlier age, her mom taught her how to depend on God. She taught her that Jesus was her father and that he loved her so much and that he would protect her. He would provide for her and he would produce great love inside of her. And this little girl continued to grow up in church. She continued to grow up around the things of God, continued to hold on to the love of her father. She continued to walk through life knowing that God loved her and that he would protect her. And this little girl is my wife. And I know as we were preparing for today, we both talked about how hard this could be to share this part of your story because it is a very private part. But I want you to know something. I don't know anyone in the world who has embraced the love of our Heavenly Father the way you have, who has decided that God is your dad and that he is your protector and your provider and that he even spoils you as well, like your daddy spoils you. And I agree, he gave you me, so like, <laughs> he spoils you. <laughs> but I'm so proud of the woman that you are and the example that you are to just actually show people what the love of the Father looks like, to receive it, to embrace his love as your heavenly Father. And I'm so thankful that um, we're sharing this story because I know it's gonna impact so many people who just don't have God's love and I'm thankful for you and 
Thank you for even showing me to accept God's love when even I felt like he couldn't love someone like me. You've shown that to me, and I just want to take a moment to honor you and to say thank you. Love you. Of myself. Um, I want to say one more thing, babe. I think uh, it's so important the way that you've actually lived this out. It doesn't just impact you. It doesn't just impact a lot of people, but it, it, it's changing the legacy of our kids, of Rex and Audrey, as they've, um, if they, they watch you and they've learned from you how to receive the Father's love and to walk in his love. Um, you're changing the legacy of our family, and I thank you for that. A woman and a little girl who both needed the love of the Father, who lived through incredible struggles and pain, who made a choice to receive and believe that God is a loving Father. And this is so important because when we receive the Father's love is when we can actually give it away. He walks with you. He stops for you. He talks to you. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. At all of our churches, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you are a loving Father who lavishes his love on us. As in an attitude of prayer, if you're here today and you recognize that I mean, there's been times in your life where you've doubted the love of your Father, Maybe you're here and you're, you just need to know that God loves you. You want to experience God's love in a deeper way. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you today. Hands going up all over this place at all of our Life Church locations. Hands going up. I'm going to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I pray for every person here that needs to experience your love, the love of the Father. Lord, overwhelm them with your love. Remind them, God, that there's nothing we can do to separate us from your love. Nothing we can do to make you love us less, to make us love you more, to make you love us less or make you love us more. You love us just as we are. As we continue praying today, there are those of you here that in, a, in this very next moment, you're gonna go from being someone in the crowd to becoming a child of God. I believe it because God brought you here for this moment to surrender your life to him. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship, actually embracing God as your loving father. And here's the thing, if we were to sit down and talk and ask you, how do you stand? Where do you stand with God? If you were honest, you might say things like, I don't know that God could love me. I've sinned a lot. I've made a lot of mistakes. And it's true. We all sin. We all fall short of God's standard. And yet today, God brought you to tell you that he loves you. And he loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus for you, who died on a cross, but then rose again after three days so that you and I could have new life, have forgiveness of our sins, and experience his love in a deep way. And for many of you, that's why you're here, and it's time to surrender your life to Jesus. It's time to let go of your past and embrace the future that God has for you by entering into a relationship with him. So if that's you and you say, I'm ready, I'm ready to turn away from my sins. I'm ready to turn towards Jesus and give him my life. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand up right now. Shoot your hand up in the air and say yes to Jesus. I see you back there. God bless you. Welcome to the family of God. Those of you online, type it in the chat. I'm giving my life to Christ. At all of our churches, would you pray together? Pray with those around you. Just repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I give you my life. I surrender my heart. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you and serve you every day of my life. Today I receive the Father's love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, church, would you celebrate and welcome people into the family of God today.